Thank you very much, Dr. McGuire, and thank you so much for this invitation. For me, this is just such a treat to talk about Russian history, taking a, a break from the fascinating, challenging, and rewarding, but still sometimes quite difficult job of running the college. Uh, I have been dean since 2014. Every year has been different. This one no less different, in fact, more different than most. I, uh, so I, I really appreciate your coming here into this dark and gloomy space when it's a beautiful afternoon outside. Uh, I'm going to stay seated. It's, it's, to me, it seems a little more informal than if I were standing at the podium. And I've taken the book talk that I've given several times before to various audiences, and I've changed it somewhat to help you see how the history of this one, the life history of this one remarkable Russian woman who's been dead since 1956, actually shed some light on some of the major issues that are the focus of the Ryan Center. Uh, in particular, the study of uh, constitutional democracies, uh, something uh, to which our heroine actually sacrificed, if not her life, her fortune and her fate. So I will focus today a bit more than I usually do on her political career, and in particular, what was liberalism in the context of 20th century Russian history. We don't usually associate Russia with liberalism. We associate it with authoritarianism or with uh, totalitarianism uh, or uh, with communism. And yet Russia has a fascinating, uh, constant theme of uh, a westernized liberalism in its political spectrum. So I'll focus a little bit on that today, but at the same time hope to give you a flavor of this remarkable woman and her very long and dramatic life. And I will try to speak, Steve, you give me a high sign when a half an hour is up, please. And, and that way I don't keep everybody too long and there'll be time for questions. So uh, I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a challenging year. It, 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 just when you think we're beginning to understand how difficult a year this is, it becomes, in another way, more difficult. But believe me when I say it pales in comparison to 1917, if you had, happened to be a Russian. So I'm going to take you to a date at the very end of that revolutionary year. December 10th, 1917, the date of the first public trial by the Bolsheviks of an enemy of the people after they seized power in late October of 1917. And this sketch that you see from a newspaper article about this trial from a Petrograd newspaper in mid-December depicts the defendant in this trial our Countess Sofia Panina, former assistant minister of education in the government, the so-called provisional government that the Bolsheviks overthrew in October. Here's a photograph of her trial. And you can see that um, she is in this photo as she was in so many public moments of her life, the only woman. Uh, depicted. She was at this time 46 years old, as I said, uh, assistant minister of education in this government that had just been overthrown by the Bolsheviks. Whether you call it a revolution or a coup uh, depends on your politics. And the court, the tribunal, was made up of seven men, five of whom were workers, and two of whom were soldiers, all members of this radical Bolshevik party. 
You can see the soldiers in their uniforms. But what, what strikes me, and I hope it strikes you as well, by the working class members of this tribunal is the fact they're wearing suits and ties and high starched collars, bourgeois attire for this revolutionary tribunal, and this was their first trial. There was a large audience for this trial. Uh, it was held in the former palace of one of the Grand Dukes, which the Bolsheviks had also commandeered just a couple of weeks before, in the ballroom of this palace. I was fortunate enough to visit it. And uh, they, they commandeered not only the palace, but its exquisite antique furniture for the trial. And the ballroom was filled mostly with Countess Panina's devoted friends and supporters who had known her for many years for her educational and cultural work among, guess who, the working class of St. Petersburg before the war. There were also Western journalists in attendance. Uh, lots and lots of Western journalists went to Russia to observe the unfolding revolution. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever read 10 Days That Shook the World by John Reed, the American socialist. He was there with the equally famous Louise Bryant. Here they are. They both attended Countess Panina's trial and wrote about it, although they, they wrote a lot of lies about actually how the trial went in order to make it fit their agenda, which is extremely interesting. So, what did the tribunal, what did the Bolsheviks find to charge this countess with? Well, of course, she was a countess. I'll explain to you what her, what her ancestry was. Uh, but there were very specific charges against her, and that were, there were two. Sabotage against the Bolshevik government and theft of the people's money. And I'll explain to you exactly what she had done that earned her those two charges, sabotage and theft. Now, the curious thing is that uh, this is approximately six weeks after the Bolshevik seizure of power on the night of October 24th, 25th, 1917. And by the end of November, the jails and prisons of Petrograd, still Russia's capital, were filled to overflowing with enemies of the people arrested by the Bolsheviks. Former ministers of the Tsar's government, uh, members of the imperial family uh, themselves, uh, members of the overthrown provisional government, they had plenty of potential defendants to choose from. But they chose a woman. They chose Sophia Panina. And I hope to uh, help you understand why they made this choice. It wasn't a very smart choice, as the trial turned out. It didn't prove their point, so they, they didn't try that again. They didn't try a woman again, uh, not for quite a few years. But why did she become the first political prisoner to face this revolutionary tribunal? So uh, let me know if you know something about the Russian revolutions of 1917. A little bit? OK. Not, it doesn't, not in high school history. OK. So I'm going to give you a little, a little refresher, a little primer. And you all, of course, know the Romanovs, Nicholas and Alexandra. Uh, still, uh, after a 300-year dynasty, uh, Russia at this time in 1917, when the year opened, Nicholas and Alexandra were still on the throne. Russia was still at war on the side of the Allies, France and Great Britain, not quite yet the United States, against Germany and Austria-Hungary in World War I, and losing very, very badly. I could go on and on, but that's all you need to know. In February, late February, demonstrations, strikes, mass protests begin to erupt in the streets of Petrograd, leading then to mutinies by soldiers who were garrisoned in Petrograd. And suddenly, 
without any apparent planning, this 300-year-old dynasty and centuries-old uh, czarist autocracy was overthrown almost overnight with practically no, nobody left to support it. The unrest culminated in, at the beginning of March of 1917 with the abdication of Nicholas II. He abdicated in favor of his son, but as you probably remember, his son uh, had suffered from hemophilia, uh, so he didn't abdicate, rather, in favor of his son. He abdicated in favor of his brother, Michael, who wisely refused to take the throne. And practically overnight, Russia, a, an absolute monarchy for centuries, became a democratic republic. A government was formed, a temporary or so-called provisional government. And that government was initially dominated by the party that our heroine, Countess Panina, threw her lot in with in 1917. This party was the dominant non-socialist liberal party in Russia, uh, revealingly called the Constitutional Democratic Party. That tells you what its principles were. And I'll tell you a bit more about this party and Russian liberalism, liberalism in the Russian context shortly. But this was the party that dominated the first provisional government that was created in early spring 1917. And understanding Russian liberalism is key to understanding both Sophia during this year and her subsequent fate. Then, of course, there was a second revolution, which I've already referred to, in that very tumultuous year on the night of October 24th, 25th, when the radical socialist Bolshevik party staged a successful coup against the provisional government and seized the instruments of power in the capital of Petrograd. Now, it's one thing to take over the government buildings, the telegraph agency, the news offices of newspapers, et cetera, in capital. But how about trying to cement that control over a, a former empire that covers 11 time zones? It took the Bolshevik party, the communist regime, communist government that they created, another three years to secure their radical socialist revolution over the whole country. So that's the general context. That's your little mini history lesson of Russia in 1917. Countess Panina was one of the most visible women throughout this revolutionary year. She was not only the first defendant in the first political trial, she was also the first woman in world history to hold a government cabinet position. And she also played a very influential leading role in the anti-Bolshevik Liberal Party and the city council of Petrograd. In addition, and not insignificantly, she played a major role in the introduction of universal women's suffrage and political equality for women in 1917, because although this was a male-dominated revolution, and Sophia Panina was one of the very few active, visible women in the revolution, Russia also played a leading role in the introduction of political equality for women, three years before the passage of the 19th Amendment in the United States. Her whole life, exemplifies in a particularly dramatic way, and she had a very dramatic life, the radical changes in the status, role, and worldview of women in modern history, and also of the European aristocracy. Although she ended up on the losing side of the revolution, her life shows a successful example of the aristocracy's ability to adapt to modernity in Europe and she also is a wonderful example of the so-called new woman of her era, independent, emancipated, and empowered. I think it's uh, these qualities. This uh, portrait of her was on the flyer that the Ryan Center created. I think these qualities, uh, her independence, 
her sense of self-empowerment are somehow expressed in this wonderful portrait of her by the great Russian realist painter when he painted her portrait in 1909, when she was at this time 38 years old. So her life also illuminates the rise and fall of Russian liberalism, what one might call an alternative historical path for Russia to have taken in the early 20th century. Historians in my field of modern Russian history continue to debate, as they have for 100 years, whether there really was a, a viable alternative to the path Russia took after 1917 to uh, 75 plus years as a communist uh, country uh, based on a socialist, socialist economic system. I happen to be on the side of those who believe that the World War I and Russia's defeat in the war was critical in the defeat of a, a more liberal, more evolutionary rather than revolutionary alternative. Uh, others uh, in, my, in my tribe believe that revolution, violent, radical revolution was inevitable given the course of Russian history. Um, our, our Sofia Panina, our heroine, placed her life, her fortune, and her fate on the side of this liberal alternative. And while she did so in 1917, she actually had done so as a child, as a young woman, and uh, as, as a leader of progressive philanthropy in the capital of Russia before 1917. So let's find out a little bit more about her. Uh, Sofia Panina was born in Moscow in 1871. And she was the heiress to one of Russia's great aristocratic fortunes, the Panin fortune, a fortune built on serfdom. Her grandfather, Victor Panin, was one of the uh, largest serf owners, uh, equivalent to slave owners. He owned tens of thousands of human souls before the abolition of serfdom in Russia in 1861. That was his ba the basis of his fortune and hers as well. She was his only heir. Even though Russian aristocratic norms discouraged people talking openly about money, she herself, in speaking toward the end of her life to an audience in Los Angeles, described herself as having been very rich. The defining event in Sophia's childhood was a custody battle between her conservative Panin grandmother and her free-spirited mother, Anastasia. So on the, over there, you're right, right? Uh, you see Sophia's parents, Anastasia, also uh, descended from an extremely wealthy aristocratic family, and her father, Vladimir Panin, who died when Sophia was not quite two years old. Sophia's mother then was widowed at a very young age and uh, acted in a way that offended the conservative norms of her mother-in-law, the old Countess Panina. And that uh, disapproval of Sophia's mother reached a peak when Anastasia married the divorced leader of the liberal opposition movement emerging against the Tsar in the late 1870s. The man on your right, Ivan Petrenkevich, known as the father of Russian liberalism. Uh, Anastasia and Ivan married in 1882. And at this point, Sophia's paternal grandmother was outraged. She felt that Sophia's mother and stepfather were going to take the Panin fortune and fund radical opposition movements to the Tsar uh, with uh, the Panin money. And she appealed to the emperor, Alexander III, who granted custody, uh, took custody of Sophia from her mother and granted it to her grandmother. So there was in this 
personal fight between mother and mother-in-law over Sophia, age 11, when this custody battle reached its peak, but there was a strong political undercurrent, a clash between conservative monarchist values and this emerging anti-autocratic liberal movement headed by, really created by, now Sophia's stepfather, Petrinkevich. So uh, Alexander III removed the 11-year-old Sophia from her mother's custody and sent her to one of the elite schools for girls from the nobility, a boarding school in St. Petersburg called the Catherine Institute, where the values were the antithesis of Sophia's mother's values of freedom and self-determination. In schools like this, the values were uh, loyalty to the monarchy. You can see the portraits on the wall of this mu music room. Uh, there are portraits of two couples, two imperial couples, two emperors and empresses. And uh, the, the six years that Sophia spent in this institution, uh, in her telling of it, were continual clashes between her values that she had learned from her mother and the very conservative values of this institution. But in fact, she was not a rebel as a girl. She uh, matured to become a highly eligible society bride in St. Petersburg, quite, in my view, quite attractive. I don't know if you would agree with me, but she certainly dressed very nicely. And of course, extremely wealthy, quite an heiress. And so she became one of the most eligible society brides in St. Petersburg. She did marry. She married an extremely wealthy, uh, very well-connected young officer. And that marriage lasted only six years for reasons that you'll have to read the book to find out. Um, but uh, she, uh, even before she filed for divorce from her dashing, very attractive husband, uh, she was already venturing into the realm of philanthropy. In Russia, as in elsewhere, philanthropy was the one area where women could play any kind of public role. It was seen as an acceptable public role for women. When her grandmother died, the one who had taken her away from her mother, when her grandmother died in 1899, Sofia Panina was not quite 30 years old. And she inherited the bulk of this Panin fortune. She became, in effect, the owner and manager of a very large business enterprise, which included landed estates in various parts of Russia, urban properties, stocks, and bonds, along with a fabulous art collection, which is in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And she worried a lot about how to handle this fortune that had suddenly landed, well, not suddenly, but that had landed in her hands. And how would she be a responsible steward of this money that, after all, she had not earned? It came to her through inheritance. And to help her figure out how she was going to be an effective steward of this fortune, she had a woman who, probably even more than her mother, influenced her outlook and her personal goals. And in this photograph of the two of them together, taken in 1913, I think you can see the sharp contrast between Sophia over here and her mentor, Alexandra Peshakhanova. They were very unlikely pair. Alexandra was a school teacher when Sophia met her in the 1890s at an elementary school in an impoverished neighborhood in St. Petersburg. After they became acquainted, they worked very closely together in this impoverished neighborhood on the outskirts of St. Petersburg on various small-scale charitable projects. When Sophia inherited her grandmother's fortune in 1899, 
she and Alexandra were able to realize a long-held dream, to create what was called a people's house for the education and cultural enlightenment of residents of one of the poorest industrial neighborhoods in St. Petersburg. People's houses were part of a liberal or progressive social movement at the turn of the century, which we can find everywhere from Russia to California. In the US and in, in Great Britain, you had settlement houses. You may have heard of uh, Jane Addams Hull House, the first American settlement house. Uh, these were community centers that progressive philanthropists established in working class neighborhoods in cities to bring culture, enlightenment, education, opportunity, and also citizenship training to members of the working class, men and women. In most of these countries, uh, Western countries, European countries, working men had only recently gained the vote. In Britain, for example, there was a property qualification that you needed to meet in order to vote. But uh, so uh, reformers were very interested in creating good citizens out of these newly enfranchised working men and eventually uh, women. And Sophia's People's House pursued many of these same goals. It still exists today. That's what it looks like in 2011 when I took this photograph. That's what it looked like in 1903 when it was built. In fact, it still exists today. It's a, under a different name. It's called the Railroad Workers Palace of Culture, but pursues many of the same objectives, to provide a community space where people from disadvantaged, we will now say, backgrounds, disadvantaged circumstances, can seek rest, refreshment, educational opportunities, opportunities to learn about the wider world. The institution held classes for adults and children, Sunday readings for families, dances and Christmas parties for children. Men and women learned to read and write there. They formed their own poetry and drama circles, and these were these were working class men and women who worked six days a week, 12 hours a day, and lived with their families in one room. Every day, the tea room was open to provide a spacious place to bring the family and to spend a quiet afternoon with a newspaper and a pot of tea. The, uh, one of the most controversial aspects, at least in the eyes of the local police, was the lecture series that the People's House, uh, run by Sophia Panin and Alexandra, held. Uh, they held regular lectures on topics, some of which were very innocuous, like oceans or the animals of Africa. And some of them were quite controversial, like women's equality or working class rights or the uh, American millionaires. And uh, the local police attended every single lecture, and they would, they would uh, disband a lecture if it went against what they considered to be political correctness, Russian autocracy style. So if you look in this picture, you can see right there. Can you see the man in the uniform? Um, this, that's a magic lantern, by the way. It's an early slide machine. Um, well, early PowerPoint projector. And of course, you have the, the man in the uniform. He's there from the police to make sure that the, uh, the lecturer, doesn't, lecturer doesn't go off and to start talking about revolution. So through her people's house, primarily, uh, Sophia Panina had other charitable causes as well. She was uh, a founder and leader of the anti-prostitution movement in Russia as well. But especially through this institution, she became very well known in the city and across Russia for her progressive philanthropy. How am I doing on time? Uh, three minutes. Okay. Zero minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, in the eyes of some 
she was a, a, a hero. She represented this kind of uh, aristocratic democracy, the, the dedication of her fortune to improving the lives and raising the consciousness and, and of members of the working class in St. Petersburg. To members of, of her class, the aristocracy, and some members of her own family, she was actually sometimes called the Red Countess and looked on as something of a radical. I'm going to switch briefly to World War I. Uh, Germany declared war against Russia in July of 1914. By early August, all of the major European powers were at war. And this war, amongst its many, many uh, lasting historical effects, had a huge impact on women. Uh, this dual slide shows you uh, our heroine in 1913 on the eve of the war. And then a war loan poster, which says everything for the war and depicts one of the millions of women who entered into previously male-dominated occupations as millions of men were drafted into the war effort. Sofia Panini became a leader in the organization of war relief in the capital now called Petrograd, renamed from St. Petersburg, especially relief for wives and children of soldiers and the hundreds of thousands of refugees who poured into the capital city as the German army occupied Russian Poland. This group of soldiers' wives, I have two photos showing uh, you what they looked like in uh, 1916 after two years of war. In Russia, as in many other countries, the wives and families of mobilized soldiers were given state monthly allowances to keep them going. And uh, in this first photo, you, uh, in the, that photo, you see them registering for their monthly allowances. Sophia was in charge uh, in the whole city of this system of providing monthly assistance to soldiers' wives. On the left, you see the wives and their children, some children in a canteen. Uh, this is early winter, this is winter, uh, February, I think, of 1916. You'll notice what? They're all wearing their coats and hats indoors, an indication by this time of the scarcity of fuel and the increasingly cold and hungry times that were affecting the capital. From there, we actually have women like the ones that you see in this photograph leading the first demonstrations in February of 1917 against the war and against the monarchy. So, five minutes, a brief sketch of her activity in 1917. It was this record of Sofia Panina's as a progressive philanthropist and also a leader in relief efforts to war victims. Uh, with this record, she moved very quickly to the forefront of political events in 1917. One of the most important things she did was to join the cadet or constitutional democratic party. And this is the reason that she gave much later for joining this party. Many of those around me considered me a socialist, she explained, because of her years of work with the people's house and the working poor. Therefore, she said, I continued it necessary at the moment when the political struggle intensified to establish my position with complete precision and dissociate myself from the socialist madness that had seized the country. I joined the Party of Popular Freedom, the Constitutional Democratic Party, which alone at that time, out of all the non-socialist parties, openly battled with advancing Bolshevism. My entire future fate was determined by that moment, and indeed it was that moment of joining the leading liberal non-socialist party led to her brief but important visibility 
between the two revolutions, her arrest after the Bolshevik Revolution, her trial, and eventually her flight from her country in 1920, to which she never returned. Um, so I think I will probably stop there. And maybe in the, in the discussion, talk about a bit more about this liberal dilemma for people like Sofia Panina, caught between two revolutions, but also talk about anything else you're curious about. As you might be able to tell, I can talk all day about this. So yes, yes, please. It was a government-issued allowance, like a welfare payment. Uh, other, other combatant states did the same thing uh, to, to support families who were left without their breadwinner uh, when the war began. Uh, but she used her own money to fund charitable enterprises like, like this, plus her people's house continued to stay open through the course of the war, she, she turned the theater that you saw in the previous slide with the policeman, she turned that theater into a, a hospital for wounded soldiers, for example. And she funded that with her own money. She spent unstintingly. I, I, I've had this wonderful opportunity to, to look at the archives of the People's House during World War I and just see how inflation increased the monthly expenses and her, she underwrote all of the expenses and her subsidies got bigger and bigger and bigger. Of course, inflation made that money matter less and less. Mark. So you mentioned that uh, the, the charge of sabotage against the uh, government. Oh, yes. So could you could yes. elaborate on that? Absolutely. So when the Bolsheviks seized power, October 24th, 25th, uh, Sofia Panina was assistant minister of education in the government that was overthrown, the provisional government. All the ministers were arrested that night or shortly thereafter, but she stayed, along with uh, most of the other assistant ministers, she continued to be free. And the assistant ministers formed an underground government they called it the little provisional government, and they tried to keep not only the bureaucracy going, but to boycott the Soviet takeover of ministries, including her Ministry of Education. So she ordered officials in the Ministry of Education to take the petty cash of the ministry and deposit it in a foreign bank so that it wouldn't fall in hands of the Bolsheviks. Next day, Commissar arrives to take over the Ministry of Education. He says, where's the money? They say, well, here's, here's Countess Panina's order as assistant minister to, uh, to deposit the money. I never was able to find out where this money ended up. Uh, some bank somewhere may be still sitting there, 93,000 rubles may still be sitting in some Deutsche Bank, maybe, who knows where. But um, that was the charge of theft of the people's money. And then sabotage uh, had to do with her uh, support, and indeed, some people say her initiation of a strike by civil servants who refused to hand papers over, office keys over, and that sort of thing. And think, think of the mechanics of a revolution. Somebody's got to come in and take control of the instruments of, the pow of power. Well, the instruments are the filing cabinets, the petty cash, the, the, the sign on the office door. Um, and, and so that was where the charge of sabotage came from. And 
why they chose her among all of these other political prisoners that they had. Well, I think it was partly for the, what they, the Bolsheviks probably expected to be huge propaganda value. And it was in the eyes of John Reed and Louise Bryant that here you had this wealthy countess who stole 93,000 rubles, resisted the government, and it was a great, uh, put a countess on trial, put a countess and an heiress on trial. And it backfired in, in ways that I, I actually devote a whole chapter in the book to the trial, which was quite a spectacle. Dr. Imabar. You talked about an argument between you and your other historian colleagues. And can you, I, can you explain what that was? Yes. And Karen Panina fits right into that. Argument. Yes, she does. She, she fits perfectly into that argument. And, and it, the argument has to do really with the fundamental his, uh, principle of history, which is contingency versus inevitability. It is very easy to make the argument that the, the, the political system that existed up to 1917, in which you had uh, it, still an absolute ruler, there was a Russian parliament with very limited powers, and constraints on civil rights, democratic institutions, there is certainly an argument that could be made that this uh, political system was bound to collapse, was, was bound to fall apart and to be replaced uh, given centuries or at least decades of class resentment, for example, uh, a background of 300 years of serfdom in the country, exploitation of the working class, all of the miseries of early industrialization. That argument is that revolution was inevitable. Violent, class-based revolution. And that you, in order to understand 1917, you need to understand 1905 and 1892 and 1861. That's one, that's one course. The other position is really focuses on the years just before 1917 and looks at the formation of legal political parties like the Constitutional Democrats, the functioning of a parliament, not one that, well, these days our Congress isn't functioning all that well either, so uh, who, can, who can cast dispersions on the Russian parliament in the early 20th century? Um, a rising standard of living by certain measures, including the consumption of tea. And then along comes World War I, a war for which Russia was not prepared, nobody was prepared, which lasted, everybody thought they were gonna be home by Christmas. Instead, it dragged on at a cost of millions of lives and, and countless treasure. And so, in the, in the other explanation is that you have to look at the war and its destabilizing effects that triggered this revolution in 1917. Not one, but two revolutions because the government that Sofia Panina joined, that provisional government, made one really big mistake. They didn't think it was a mistake, of course, but that mistake was to keep Russia in the war. Now you had a democratic Russia under these new leaders after the Tsar abdicated. And so now we were really a full-fledged member of the democratic allies, Great Britain, France, and then in April of 1917, the United States. Sofia Panina, as assistant minister, met with visiting Americans, members of the, the mission to Russia that came, sent by Woodrow Wilson. So that's, the, that's the, the, the argument really focuses on, on the, the effect of World War I and, um, and this possibility of an alternative 
to which she devoted 20 years of her life as a philanthropist, helping to create what she considered to be enlightened and free citizens out of a population that was downtrodden, exploited, underpaid, overworked, but could find a refuge in this beautiful institution. So it was a near thing. It, 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 well, I'm the one who's telling this story, and I'm on the one side. So yes, I'm making it seem. Uh, <laughs> We would not have Putin, that's right. We would not have Putin if Sophia had her way. And maybe not Trump either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing me back to that point. That, that is, is an important one. It is a question of, of the viability of a liberal, a peaceful liberal alternative. And one could, you, know, you can write this about any revolution, 1789 in France, and it's a radical turn. Where did that come from? Was that inherent in revolution? Or was that a product of extraneous or accidental forces? John Paul? Tribunal. Yes. I could go into that for a very long time, so I will just be very brief. The class dynamic was certainly reflected in, in the clothing, but you will remember what she was wearing. She was not wearing ostrich feathers and diamonds. She was dressed, in the words of one American journalist who wrote about the trial, she looked like an American social worker in a little black hat, a little black suit, white shirt. So um, the class dynamic was really on full display in this trial. And it was, on the one hand, in the eyes of the accusers, this fake philanthropy by this aristocratic countess who then, when push came to shove, uh, led sabotage against the people's revolution and stole the people's money. There was a lot of disagreement about what this money actually was. Was it wages? Was it charitable donations? It was all kind of, even she herself called the trial comical, although she didn't know how she was going to end up. And then you had the courtroom filled with her supporters, jeering, heckling, shouting, objecting to this tribunal, and you had these seven men, they had no idea what they were doing. This was the first trial, and they were making up revolutionary law by the seat of their pants. And the head of the tribunal, the guy in the middle with the starched white shirt, who later became a victim of Stalin's terror, by the way, um, he, he himself wrote a very brief memoir, two pages about this, in which he said, well, we kind of didn't know what we were doing. I really had to make it up as I went along. And so he followed what he thought was the example of the French Revolutionary Tribunal. If you've all read Tale of Two Cities, Madame Defarge, you know, the people accuse, the people defend. So he first asked, is there an accuser in the audience? Well, the audience was filled with her supporters. So no accuser stood up. And then he said, well, is there, is there a defender? And this working man stands up. Oh, they think, finally, we've got an accuser. But instead, this man says, I went to the people's house. I learned to read and write there. Countess Pinin is our son. 
S-U-N, our, our salvation. She's no enemy of the people. She's a friend of the people. So anyway, it was right at this moment of the formation of revolutionary images and stereotypes about class and how confusing and how liminal this point was. She was sent back to prison, by the way. She was, uh, she ref they said, well, we'll let you go if you pay back the money. I just, I'm not paying back the money. It's not your money, it's not my money, it's the, it's, it's the people's money. I'll, I'll tell you where it is when, the legit when there's a legitimate government. So they sent her back to prison and she was there for another two weeks and friends on the outside got a little worried because shall we say uh, public order degenerated quickly in Petrograd at the end of 1917. And so they raised the money and they ransomed her out of prison. And she was released just before Christmas uh, 1917, but at the request of the Bolshevik commandant of the prison, she went back on Christmas Day with her magic lantern and slides of paintings of the nativity and gave a Christmas lecture to the inmates of the women's prison where she'd been incarcerated for three weeks. She was some gal. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, her mother was fairly liberal. Uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more maybe about the, the sources of her, her own liberalism. Were there particular intellectual sources that she was uh, reading and referring to? And, or how did she you know, come to these ideas? Was it all through her mother? Or, and you know, when she was sent to boarding school, uh, how did she continue to adhere right. to it? It was, uh, it was not, I hate to say this in an academic environment, but it was not through reading. Um, it was very much through doing, I think, and the circles that she traveled in, uh, getting to know people like the school teacher, Alexandra Peshkhonova. Also, uh, there was certainly a, a, a tradition of liberalism among some members of the aristocracy, I and mean, it shows we cannot simply label aristocracy as ipso facto conservative. Uh, her mother and her stepfather were certainly powerful influences, but they were much more political. Sophia had nothing to do formally with her stepfather's party, the Constitutional Democrats, the cadets until, as she says, 1917. But I, I found a big fat police file on her. The czarist pol secret police kept files on her. They considered her to be a liberal, but not too left. So in the eyes of the, the czarist police, she, she was not exactly a political, po unreliable, shall we say. And there's a record also of her assisting more radical opponents of the regime under, uh, underground. Uh, but I think this is actually one of, the, one of the enigmas that I never solved in all the work that I did on this, is how she managed, even how she managed to establish this institution. It should have been closed down by the authorities. It was arguably a dangerous institution. It, it gave lectures to workers on workers' rights and, and trade unions in Europe. And yet, she just sort of proceeded on. The influences on her were daily life, I would say, and her personal connections and not, not intellectual. She did go to, uh, there were women's colleges in Russia at this time, and she went and she attended some courses in St. Petersburg at the Women's College, but she didn't finish. So I don't know whether there's, there was an intellectual influence on her as well. But it is, you know, it's, it's the power of, of daily action. Our students see it when they do service. That's as, as educational, I hate to say it, as, as reading a as reading a book. <laughs>
usually. I mean, it's nice to have, do the two together, but action, daily life, encounters with people who are different from you. And that's what she did. She was at this institution every day. She wasn't running it from her mansion in the center of the city. She was there every day. Definitely. Yeah. Right. Their model was a Western model of bourgeois democratic constitutional political system. Uh, Great Britain was one model with a constitutional monarchy and a, a, a body of, of uh, rights for political rights, for citizens, established political parties. The rule of law was a very central principle to Russian liberalism, uh, in contrast to what was regarded, what was, very arbitrary uh, political action, government action, and, and the, the disregard of rights of individuals. Russia had had a revolution in 1905, which had not overthrown the Tsar, but he had granted a constitution. And that was when this parliament, the Duma, was created. Political parties were legalized. And the Cadet Party, the Constitutional Democratic Party, was one of the most influential parties in this constitutional system. But the Tsar still called himself an autocrat. He still called himself an absolute ruler. and. He could veto, uh, and, and he could uh, manipulate the electoral law to make sure that the Duma, the parliament, played, played his way. But their, their principles were the rule of law, protection of, of civil rights, uh, popular representation, the say of the people in government. Um, they recognized inequality, economic inequality, the need for social reform, workers' insurance, and things like that, but not uh, that property is theft or the nationalization of wealth uh, or class war. I'll, um, I'm very conscious that it's Friday afternoon and it is a beautiful day. So I'll just, if you don't mind, Tell, finish my slides by telling you whatever happened to our heroine, okay? So that you're not left in suspense. Um, oh, this is, this is the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party's Central Committee. If you look really, really, really hard, you'll see two female faces in this mass of men's faces. Unfortunately, neither of them is our heroine, but that is just shows you how, what a masculine world she stepped into. Let's see. Um, she first uh, fled, she fled Russia in 1920, ended up for a brief time in England, where these photographs, well, that one was taken in England. This, um, which is the cover of the book, this was taken sometime around 1920. She ended up in Geneva for three years where she represented a major Russian refugee relief organization at the League of Nations, working on relief for the hundreds of thousands of Russian refugees, like herself. Uh, then she moved to Czechoslovakia and she lived in Prague from 1924 to 1938. Prague was a center of Russian emigre life and she ran an community center, again, for Russian emigres this time in Prague. Uh, 
And then if you remember your European history, things got a little uncomfortable in Czechoslovakia as Hitler's uh, began to cast his eye on the German borderlands of Czechoslovakia. And in October of 1938, she received an invitation from her stepbrother to come to America. Her stepbrother was a Yale professor of entomology. There he is, fondly known as the King of Spiders. And she arrived in New York on the ship SS Champlain in January of 1939. And she lived in the United States for the rest of her life. She died in New York City, in Roosevelt Hospital in 1956. And you can visit her grave. It is in Spring Valley, New York. If you get to the very end of the Garden State Parkway, you cross right over, you go through Spring Valley, Valley Cottage, there's a big Russian Orthodox cemetery and convent right there, and that's where she was laid to rest in 1956. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention and your interest. I really appreciate it. It was a labor of love, and I love sharing my story with others like you. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>